the nativity of the Blessed Virgin. What gladness throughout all nature. Birds are singing, lambs and kids are gamboling, and swarms of doves are fluttering with joy around the spot upon which once stood Anne's abode. I see only a wilderness there at the present day. But I had a vision of pilgrims in the far-off times who, girded and with long staves in their hands, wended their way through the country to Mount Carmel. On their head they wore a covering wound around like a turban. They too participated in the joy of nature. And when in their astonishment they asked the hermits that dwelt in the neighborhood the cause of this remarkable exaltation, they received for answer, that such manifestations of gladness were customary. They were always observed upon the eve of the anniversary of Mary's birth around that spot where once stood Anne's house. The hermits told them of a holy man of the early times who had been the first to notice these wonders in nature. His account gave rise to the celebration of the feast of Mary's nativity which soon became general throughout the church. And now I too beheld how this came to pass. I saw a pious pilgrim, 250 years after Mary's death, traversing the Holy Land, visiting and venerating all places connected with the actions of Jesus while on earth. He was supernaturally guided. Sometimes he tarried several days together in certain places in which he tasted extraordinary consolation. There he prayed and meditated, and there also he received revelations from on high. For several years he had, from the 7th to the 8th of September, noticed a great jubilation in nature and heard angelic voices singing in the air. He prayed earnestly to know the meaning of all this, and it was made known to him in a vision that that was the birth night of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He was on his way to Mount Sinai when he had this vision. In it he was informed also of the existence of a chapel built in Mary's honor in a cave of the prophet Elias. He was told to reveal this as well as the circumstance of Mary's birth night, to the hermits on Mount Sinai. I saw him again when he arrived at the mount. Where the convent now stands there dwelt even at that early period, hermits scattered here and there. It was then as inaccessible from the valley as it is now. To reach the top of the mountain from that side, hoisting machines were used. I saw that in consequence of the pilgrim's communication, the 8th of September was here first celebrated in the year 250, and that later it was introduced into other parts of the church. I saw hermits accompanying the pilgrim to the cave of Elias to visit the chapel that had been built there into Mary's honor. But it was not easy to find, for the mountain was covered with gardens that still produced magnificent fruits, though long allowed to run wild, and there were numerous caves of hermits and Essenians. The pilgrim who had had the vision told them to send a Jew into the different caves, and that the one out of which he should be thrust would be the cave of Elias. He had been thus instructed in vision. I then saw them sending an old Jew into the caves. But, as often as he tried to enter a certain one that had a narrow entrance built up before it, he was repulsed. By this miracle the cave of Elias was recognized. On entering it they found another cave the entrance to which had been closed by masonry. This was the chapel in which the prophet Elias had in prayer honored the future mother of the Savior. Many holy relics were still preserved in it, bones of the prophets and patriarchs, screens and vessels that had once been used in ceremonies of the old law. These latter were appropriated to the use of the church. The spot upon which the thorn bush had stood was called in the language of that country, the shadow of God. It was entered only barefoot. The Elias Chapel was walled up with beautiful large stones through which ran flower-like vinings they were afterward employed for the erection of the church. In the vicinity is a mountain entirely of red sand on which nevertheless there is very beautiful fruit. I learned from St. Bridget that if pregnant women fast on the eve of Mary's birth and say fervently nine Hail Marys to honor the nine months she passed in Anne's womb, if they frequently repeat these prayers during their pregnancy, and especially on the eve of their delivery, receiving then the holy sacraments devoutly, she will offer their prayer to God herself and bring them through even very critical circumstances to a happy delivery. I saw the Blessed Virgin on the eve of her nativity. She said to me, whoever says this evening, September 7th, nine times the Hail Mary lovingly and devoutly to honor the nine months spent in my mother's womb is also my birth, and continues the same devotion for nine consecutive days, daily gives to the angels nine flowers for our bouquet. This bouquet they bear to heaven and offer to the Most Holy Trinity to obtain some favor for the one that prays. I was transported to a high place between heaven and earth. I saw the earth below me gray and somber, and above me heaven where, among the choirs of angels and the orders of the blessed, was the Blessed Virgin before the throne of God. I saw prepared for her two thrones of honor, two buildings of honor, which finally became churches, yes, whole cities, and they were formed out of the prayers of earth. They were built entirely of flowers, leaves, garlands, 
the various species typical of the different value and characteristics of the prayers of individuals and of whole congregations. Angels and saints took them from the hands of those that offered them and bore them up to heaven. Several days previously, Anne informed Joachim that the time of her delivery was at hand. She sent messengers to her sister Maria, at Sephora's, also to the widow Anu, Elizabeth's sister, in the valley of Zabulon, and to her sister Saab's daughter Salome, the wife of Zebdi, of Bethsaida. The sons of Saab and Zebdi, James the Greater and John, were not yet born. Anne sent for these three women to come to her. I saw them on their journey. Two of them were accompanied by their husbands who returned however when they had reached the neighborhood of Nazareth. Joachim had sent the men servants off to the herds, and had otherwise disposed of the domestics not absolutely needed in the house. Mary Halley, Anne's eldest daughter, now the wife of Cleophas, took charge of the household affairs. On the evening before the birth of the child, Joachim himself went to his herds in the field nearest his home. I saw him with some of his servants who were related to him. He called them brothers, but they were only his brother's children. The pasture grounds were beautifully divided off and hedged in. In the corners were huts wherein the servants were provided with food supplied from Anne's house. There was also a stone altar before which they prayed. Steps led down to it, and the space around it was neatly paved with triangular stones. Behind the altar was a wall with steps at the sides. The whole place was surrounded by trees. Joachim, after praying here a while, selected the finest lambs, kids, and bullocks from his herds, and sent them by his servants to the temple as offerings. He did not return to his home before night. I saw the three women approaching Anne's abode toward evening. When they arrived, they went straight to her apartment back of the fireplace. Anne embraced them, told them that her time drew near, and standing intoned with them a psalm, Praise God, the Lord. He has had pity on his people and has freed Israel. Truly, he has fulfilled the promise that he made to Adam in paradise, the seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head. I do not remember all, verse for verse, but Anne rehearsed the different types of Mary, and said, The germ that God gave to Abraham has ripened in me. The promise made to Sarah and the blossom of Aaron's rod are fulfilled in me. During all this time, Anne was shining with light. The room was full of glory, and over in hovered Jacob's ladder. The women around her were amazed, entranced. I think they too saw the ladder. And now a slight refreshment was placed before the visitors. They ate and drank standing and toward midnight lay down to rest. But Anne remained up in prayer. After a while, she went and roused the women. She felt that her time was near, and she desired them to pray with her. They all withdrew behind a curtain that concealed an oratory. Anne opened the doors of a little closet built in the wall. In it was a box containing sacred treasures and on either side lights so contrived that they could be raised in their sockets at pleasure, and rested on upright supports. These lamps were now lighted. At the foot of the little altar was a cushion stool. The box contained some of Sarah's hair, which Anne held in great reverence. Some of the bones of Joseph, which Moses had brought with him out of Egypt. Something belonging to Tobias, relics of clothing, I think. And the little, white, shining pear-shaped cup from which Abraham drank when he received the blessing from the angel, and which was later on taken from the Ark of the Covenant and given to Joachim along with the blessing. This blessing was like wine and bread, like a sacrament, like a supernatural, invigorating food. Anne knelt before the shrine, one of the women on either side, and the third behind her. Again I heard them reciting a psalm. I think that the burning bush on her it was mentioned in it. And now a supernatural light began to fill the chamber and to hover around Anne. The three women fell prostrate as if stunned. Around Anne the light took the exact form of the thorn bush on her ebb, so that I could no longer see her. The flame streamed inward, and all at once I saw Anne receiving into her arms the shining child Mary. She wrapped it in her mantle, pressed it to her heart, laid it on the stool before the relics, and went on with her prayer. Then I heard the child crying and I saw Anne drawing forth some linen from under the large veil that enveloped her. She swathed the child first in gray and then in red, leaving the breast, arms, and head bare and then the luminous thorn bush vanished. The holy women arose and in glad surprise received the newborn child into their arms. They wept for joy. All intoned a hymn of praise while Anne held the child on high. I saw the chamber again filled with light and myriads of angels. They announced the child's name, singing, on the twentieth day. This child shall be called Mary. Then they sang Gloria and Alleluia. I heard all these words. Anne went to her chamber, and lay down upon her couch. 
The women bathed and swathed the child, and laid it by the mother. Next to the bed was a little portable basket creep furnished with wooden pegs, by means of which it could be stuck into holes on the right or left, or at the foot of the bed as might be desired. One of the women went and called Joachim. He entered, knelt by Anne's couch, and his tears fell in torrents over the child. Then he took it up, held it aloft, and intoned a canticle of praise like unto that of Zachary. He spoke words expressive of his longing now to die, and he alluded to the germ given by God to Abraham and perfected in himself, also to the root of Jesse. I noticed, though not till afterward, that Mary Halley was not among the first to see the child. She must at this time have been for some years the mother of Mary Cleophas. Still she was not present at Mary's birth, because the Jewish custom does not permit the daughter to be with the mother at such a time. When Mary was born, I saw her at one and the same time before the Most Holy Trinity in heaven and on earth in Anne's arms. I saw the joy of the whole heavenly court. I saw all her gifts and graces in a supernatural way revealed to her. I often have such visions, but they are for me inexpressible, for others unintelligible, therefore am I silent with regard to them. Mary was also instructed in innumerable mysteries. As this vision ended, the child cried upon earth. I saw the news of Mary's birth announced also in limbo, and I beheld the transports of joy with which it was received by the patriarchs, especially by Adam and Eve, who rejoiced that the promise made them in paradise was now fulfilled. I saw also that the patriarchs increased in grace, their abode became lighter and less constrained, and that they began to exercise a greater influence on earth. It was as if all their good works, all their penance, all the efforts of their life, all their desires and aspirations had at last brought forth fruit. All nature, animate and inanimate, men and beasts were stirred to joy, and I heard sweet singing. But sinners were filled with anguish and remorse. I saw, especially around Nazareth and in other parts of Palestine, many possessed souls who at the hour of Mary's birth became perfectly furious. They uttered horrible cries, and they were tossed and dashed about. The devils cried out of them, We must withdraw. We must go out. My greatest delight was to see the old priest Simeon in the temple on this night of Mary's birth. He was aroused by the fearful cries of the possessed confined in one of the streets on the temple mountain. Simeon with others had charge of them. He went that night to the house in which they were, and asked the cause of those shrieks that roused everyone from sleep. The possessed man nearest to the entrance cried out fiercely that he must get out. Simeon released him, and then the devil cried out, I must go forth. We must go forth. A virgin is born and there are upon earth so many angels who torment us. We must go forth, and never again shall we dare possess a human being. Then I saw the poor creature horribly tossed to and fro by the devil who at last went out of him. Simeon was in prayer. I rejoiced greatly at seeing old Simeon then. I saw two Anna, the prophetess, and another one of Mary's future teachers in the temple aroused and instructed in vision upon the birth of the child. They told each other what had happened. I think they knew of them. In the country of the three holy kings, certain prophetesses had visions of the birth of the Blessed Virgin. They told their priests that a virgin was born, to welcome whom many spirits had come down upon earth, but that other spirits were troubled. The stargazing kings also saw pictures of it in their stars. In Egypt, on the night of the birth, an idol was hurled from its temple into the sea, and another fell from its place and was dashed to pieces. Next morning I saw a great crowd from the neighborhood around the house along with Anne's servants, male and female. The women in charge showed the child to them. Many of them were very much affected, and many wicked hearts were changed. They had gathered around the house because they had seen a light over it during the night and also because the birth of Anne's child was looked upon as a great blessing. Later on other relatives of Joachim from the valley of Zabulon arrived, also the servants from a distance. The child was shown to all and a repast is prepared in the house. On the following days people flocked in numbers to see the child Mary. Her little cradle, which was in the form of a boat, was placed upon a raised pedestal, something like a sewing jack, in the front apartment. The lower coverlet was red, the upper one white, and on them lay the child swathed up to the armpits in red and transparent white. She had tiny, golden curls. I saw also Mary Cleophas, the child of Mary Helian Cleophas, the grandchild of them. She was then a little girl of only a few years. She was playing with the infant Mary and caressing her. She was a stout, healthy child. She wore a little white, sleeveless dress bordered with red from which hung tiny red balls, like apples. Around her little bare arms were twined rows of white stuff, maybe feathers or silk or wool. 
The child Mary had also a little transparent scarf around her neck.